Hello and welcome back. We're now going to look at probably the most important session that we have on this course. How to deal with question one. As I've said, most ACCA exams you cannot predict what is going to come up in terms of each question but for the P7 paper I will tell you now that something that I talk about here will come up and form the bulk of question one because question one is all about risk which we've already talked about but it's about identifying the risks in a client and you will be asked about one of three different types of risk so what we're going to do is we're going to look at each one of those risks in turn we're going to talk about what that risk is and we're going to say what you should do if that risk is examined on your paper and i would go so far as to say that one of these risks will be examined on your paper and will form the bulk of question one so if this forms say 15 to 17 marks with another two for professionalism if you could be getting maybe 12 to 15 out of whatever mark is available that can really set you up for the rest of the paper. So to me, knowing these risks is absolutely fundamental to passing the P7 paper. And not just that, knowing them is not enough. You need to know how to deal with them and you need to know the differences between them. So let's look at them in turn. The first one you might be asked to identify is business risk. Now for this, it is simply any risk that could damage the client's business. The standard itself separates them out into internal and external factors, but the sorts of things I want you to look for in the scenario, so you'll be asked to identify the business risks. If you are, you need to look for changes in legislation. Well, of course, that could damage the client's business because it could mean they either can no longer do things the way they currently do them or maybe even not at all. Technology, changes in technology. We've seen it in DVDs, we've seen it in computer technology. It moves so quickly that certain businesses can be left behind. Well, remember, if we're looking for business risks, we're looking that for anything that could damage the business, changes in technology could damage the business. So look for those in the scenario. Changes in the economy. Simply by having a recession, certain businesses will be hit particularly hard. We only need to look at the banks in the financial crisis to identify that. Competition. So of course competition could damage the business. Think of the airline industries. Think of the effect that Ryanair has had on BA, British Airways. British Airways almost went out of business as a result of the competition from the low cost airlines and that new business model. So again, competition could be a business risk, something that damages the business. Employees, loss of key staff, Again, absolutely crucial. If you don't have the key staff, you cannot carry out the business, particularly if you're involved in, let's say, research and development or an area such as that. Even systems or systems changes, old systems, new systems, all of those create a risk to the business because they may not work as expected. So that can be a business risk. Cash flow, of course, poor cash flow will damage any business, as will high levels of gearing, as will fraud. Any of those are business risks, risks that would damage the client's business. So you need to be able to look through the scenario and see, are there any business risks here and fully explain why they are a risk to the examiner. If you do that, you'll get one and a half to two marks, depending on how generous the examiner is feeling that day. Only if it's well explained. We've talked about how to go about explaining yourself in the P7 exam. Well, this is a key area 
where you'll only get the marks if it's well explained. So that's the first type of risk you might be asked to identify and we now know what to look for. The second type of risk is financial statement risk. Do note that none of those business risks were ones that we mentioned areas of the financial statements for, except maybe cash flow and gearing. Financial statement risk is the risk that there is a misstatement in the financial statements. It's the risk that there is an error. And of course, we are there as the auditor to find those errors. So if in your question you're asked to identify financial statement risks, well, basically I would think of that as the misapplication of a standard. So either they've done something incorrectly and there's been an over or an understatement of a balance, or they've not disclosed something that they should have disclosed. Those are the two ways that your financial statements can be misstated. So how do we deal with this in the exam? Well, the process is as follows. You need to discuss the standard incorrectly applied. So let's say that you have read through the scenario and they've got a new system in for recognizing revenue. And that's all you're told. Well, the risk is that it's recognizing the revenue incorrectly. So you're going to say that IAS 18 states that we should recognize the revenue on goods on the transfer of the risk and rewards of ownership when we've no management control and they've passed to the buyer. So that's what the standard says. The risk is that the new system is not doing that correctly, that it's recognizing the revenue potentially too early. And again, I'm only making this up, but remember, it's only a risk. So if you're told there's a new system, well, then that's the risk that could have come about. So discuss the standard and explain the risk that this creates. The risk here is that revenue is overstated because it's being recognized too early. Now, one thing I want you to note here is that you must say Either something is over or understated. So in our example, we said that there is a risk that revenue is overstated. Or you could have gone the other way and said there's a risk it's understated because the system isn't recognizing it correctly. Or it could be there's a non-disclosure of something that should have been disclosed. So for example, let's say that we own a retail outlet and someone has slipped and fallen and broken their leg, what are they going to do? They're going to sue us. So should we provide for that in the financial statements? Well, remember, that will be under IAS 37. We'll need to decide whether it's probable or not and whether we can put a reliable measure on it. Let's say it's only possible that we'll get sued and it will cost us three million if we do. Well. There's a risk that they haven't disclosed the required contingent liability. Because remember, if something's possible, under IAS 37, we don't create a provision, but we do disclose the nature and the effect of it in a note to the financial statements. So the financial statement risk here would be they should have included a disclosure note on this, and perhaps they didn't. So this is all about identifying where things could have been done incorrectly in the financial statements leading to a misstatement. But you must say what that misstatement is. Either it's an over or understatement of a balance or a non-disclosure. That is where the marks are for this. I cannot stress it enough. Now, as you would imagine, you'll get more marks than business risks for financial statement risks. Two to two and a half if it's well explained because it takes a little bit more, it's more complex, they're more difficult to identify than business risks. Therefore, we're going to get a few more marks. Okay, so so far we've got business risks and financial statement risks. 
The last one we could be asked for is audit risk. Now, audit risk will basically be the same as financial statement risk. It's the risk that there is a financial statement risk or a misstatement in the financial statements that the auditor does not detect. So it may be that a standard has been incorrectly applied. That creates an audit risk because the auditor may not detect that. But you still would have to identify what the standard was and what the over or understatement or non-disclosure was. So you'd still go through the same process to explain audit risks as you would for financial statement risks. However, other ones I would throw in here for audit risks would be things such as loss of key staff, because if you've lost key staff, that may mean, for example, loss of the finance director, you don't have the expertise. So therefore, there's more likely to be a misstatement somewhere in the financial statements. New client, because we don't understand them as much, we haven't dealt with them before, again, higher audit risk. Time pressure, if you're being asked to complete the audit under particular time pressure, once again, that is going to increase audit risk. Targets, remember I said that perhaps you have client staff that are under particular targets, they're stressed out, trying to meet them, well, there's a risk of manipulation to try and hit those targets. And of course, intended sale of the business. If they intend to sell it, they want to make it look as good as possible. So there's a potential for them having overstated revenue or profit in order to get the sale that they want. Lastly then, flotation. So once again, if it's newly floated, or they're about to float, they may be under pressure to give good results and that will increase audit risk, the risk of a misstatement. So once again, with audit risk, two to two and a half marks, if well explained, think of them as being similar to financial statement risks. It could be IFRS inappropriately applied, leading to an over or understatement with non-disclosure but it also includes those other aspects that will increase the risk of misstatement, loss of staff, new client, time pressure, targets, seal, flotation, all of those. And look, you will see these come up time and time again. If you go back through the past paper questions, all of these areas are heavily examined. So as I said, it's fundamental that you understand it. You should also understand that there is a link that flows through these. Business risks will often lead to financial statement risks, which as we've said then, lead to the audit risk. So following that through, you could say, let's say that there is a change in technology. So change in technology means that some of their stock is obsolete. So the change in technology could damage the business, because they're not going to sell as much. It could be in the financial statements in that we might have inventory we need to write off because we can't sell it. So that would be an overstatement of inventory. Or indeed, it may be going concern risks with non-disclosure of the going concern risk. So that would be financial statement risk. And the audit risk would be that we didn't detect that, that the inventory was overstated and we didn't detect it, and that led us to give an inappropriate opinion. So fundamentally, audit risk is the risk of expressing an inappropriate opinion. So please make sure you're comfortable with those. I would watch and re-watch this little section that we've just looked at. It's that important. Okay, let's see how we'd apply this then to a particular question, we're going to look at June 15, question one, part B. I'm going to do an answer plan first, and here you will see how fundamentally crucial it is to do an answer plan, particularly for these question ones that ask for audit risk, financial statement risk, or business risk, because you need to get used to highlighting the key areas, pulling them out, 
getting them into a plan and then expanding on them in the actual answer. So let's look at the plan first. I'll work through it. We'll plan the answer and then we'll go on ahead to look at how we would have brought that into a full answer. So we're looking here at part B of June 15, question one, and we're asked to evaluate the audit risks. So it's part B. So evaluate the audit risks, and that's the important bit. It's audit risks that we're looking for. So remember that will be anything from newly listed companies, loss of finance director, poor controls, through to mistreatment of IFRS. So all of those we need to evaluate in the planning of the audit. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to identify these as we go through the read through. I want this to replicate what you do in the exam. Now there's no point in getting your highlighter and highlighting long strips of writing because you'd almost be highlighting everything here. I just want to use a quick highlight on specific areas and words that are important here. I want to think about what those are and then over on the right hand side what I'm going to do is I'm going to develop my answer plan. So over here we'll have the plan and as we identify issues we'll get down a heading here. That heading then will form the basis for our actual answer. Now in the exam I would spend maybe 15 minutes doing this, building an answer and then bring it and actually put it into the answer document, the paper. Or you might actually put the plan in there as well and then do the full answer below and just put a note to the examiner to say that this is your answer plan. So let's start with going through the scenario, highlighting the important bits, thinking why they're important and deciding which we're going to include in our actual answer. So it's audit risks. So starting at the top, you're a manager in a firm of chartered accountants, you've been assigned to the auditor audit of TED company and straight away we have a new audit client. So before anything else comes up, we could say that specifically because TED is a new client. If it's a new client, then that has its own specific audit risks. Remember that you'll need to get to know the client, you'll need to understand the industry, you'll need to have the knowledge and experience to carry it out. So that's the first thing we might use as a heading. Moving on down this, they have a financial year ended 31st of May 15. Ted Company, a newly listed company. So newly listed, well as soon as I see newly listed, I think that is going to be a risk because if they're newly listed, first of all, they're going to have pressure on their results. So they're going to be responding to shareholders, they're going to have to try to justify what they do. So the fact that it is a newly listed company is definitely something that is going to be a risk. So a newly listed company means that we've got higher audit risk because there's a possibility of management bias. They now have pressure to result to produce good results. So that will be something we'll need to discuss in our full answer. They've grown rapidly in the last few years and they've sent you the following email. So we've read our email. We know that we're looking for audit risks. So here are some notes. Formed 10 years ago, company designs and develops computer games, highly successful games which have won industry awards. In the last two years, the company has invested 100 million in creating games designed to appeal to a broad global audience and sales are now made in over 60 companies. Now before we go any further as soon as I see the fact that they've invested 100 million I immediately start to think well what did they do with that? Um, did they capitalize it? 
under IAS 38? Or have they written it off? So we'll need to look when we come on through this scenario to see, are there any indications as to what they have done with that? But at this point, we're just trying to think, OK, we need to come back and think about that and see what has actually happened. Creating games for sales in over 60 countries, again, selling to other countries, potential audit risk, because if you're dealing with other countries, you're dealing with foreign exchange. So foreign exchange will be something that we will have to consider. Software is used in the is developed in this country, manufacture takes place overseas. There's more foreign exchange potential risk there. So that's definitely something that we're going to talk about. In fact, I'm going to look for other evidence on the IAS 38 stuff, but I'm definitely going to put into my plan number three, foreign exchange, and how we have treated the revenue, etc., that we've gained from those other countries, or indeed the costs. So the risk is that potentially that hasn't been treated correctly. Computer games are sold through retail outlets. 25% of revenues generated on the company's website. So 25% on the company's website. Well, that has specific risks in itself. So we're looking here at e-commerce. If we have e-commerce, that is always going to have specific risks. There's a risk, for example, that if you're selling online, you're not recognizing the revenue correctly. You're maybe recognizing the revenue as soon as the sale is made rather than when the goods are distributed to the eventual owner, the buyer. So that's a risk. E-commerce is going to be a risk. In fact, I'm going to put that in my plan because I'm definitely going to mention that. That's quite a big risk. So four, we have e-commerce, a risk in itself. We could even talk about detection risk because if you've got a website, it might be technical and difficult for the auditor to actually um, audit, or indeed it might be difficult or cause a difficulty because there's control risk you'll be reliant on the controls built into the software. So again, e-commerce is going to be an issue here. What else have we got? So cost of each license to the distributor depends on the estimated sales. Licenses last for an estimated average five years. The income received from the sale of the license is deferred over the period of the license. And the amount of deferred income is 18 million. Well, we'll need to check if that's material. Just looking, let's just have a look. Uh, revenue 98 million, 18 million. Yeah, that, that is going to be material profit after tax. Eight, yeah, so that's quite a bit. So if they're deferring that, is that correct? I would want to check, is that correct treatment? under IAS 18. So is that the correct treatment under IAS 18? Remember, IAS 18 says that if you have transferred the risk and rewards of ownership and you've no management control, uh, that means that you no longer control the goods and the revenue should be recognized. So is that deferral correct? So I'm going to put that down there. There's number five, um, is deferred income correct? So we'll have to have some discussion of the correct treatment under IAS 18, what they have done and why that might be a problem. Okay, so we're building up quite a plan here. Now, next we have, as part of a five-year strategic plan, Ted obtained the stock market listing. We've already highlighted that as a risk. The listing and related share issue significantly increased the amount of finance and many shares are held by institutional investors. Dougal Doyle 
retains a 20% equity shareholding and a further 10% are held by family members. Mm. Once again, I think that's an audit risk because if they hold so much shares, there's going to be an onus on them to try and get dividends. They're going to want the business to do well so they can get dividends. Would there be a risk, therefore, that they maybe overstate things? So six, the shareholding, I think. Specifically, the shareholding by the family and Dougal himself. himself. Again, there's going to be a risk that they want to overstate profit to try to get more dividends. So that, I think, is another audit risk. Despite being listed, doesn't have an internal audit department, only one non-executive director, hoping to resolve it. But these are explained in the annual report required by the governance code. Well, look, all of that, one non-executive director, no internal audit department, poor governance. So really, all of those lead us to think that perhaps... All in all, we have some poor governance in here. So I would probably put that as our next identified item to discuss. There's a whole paragraph on it. So it's definitely something the examiner is interested in. So poor governance will always raise the risk in an audit. Because number one, the controls are less likely to be good. But number two... It's also something that's set from the top of the organisation through management. If they're not interested in governance, well then maybe the organisation has a poor control environment. That will increase audit risk. Recently, as soon as I see the word recently, I think, okay, this is something that's happened in the recent past, so therefore will be a risk. It's a small treasury management function set to manage the company's foreign currency transaction includes forward exchange contracts and also deals with short-term investments. Cash of 8 million was invested in a portfolio of equity shares. So before we even talk about that, I think that's an audit risk. The risk here is we've got a new department and have they got the experience to actually deal with that? So do they know what they're doing in managing the foreign exchange risk, for example? So let's add that to our plan. I would say number eight, we have the new treasury department. Have they got the experience? Do they know what they're doing with both the foreign exchange and those short-term investments? Next, then, we have cash of 8 million invested in equity shares in listed companies. Short term as a speculative investment. Well, we should know that under IFRS 9, they should be fair value through profit and loss. Thinking back to your P2, if it's held for trading under IFRS 9, that means that we should hold them at fair value through profit and loss. However, we're actually told that they don't do that. They're held at cost and the fair value is six. So this should be creating a loss, which isn't in there. So we need to go back to our plan. That's definitely a big issue. Number nine, treatment of financial assets should be at fair value through profit and loss under IFRS 9. And it's incorrect, so we'll need to discuss that whenever we come to look at it. As a listed company, it's required to disclose earnings per share. They want to do this based on adjusted earnings figure, not including depreciation, blah, blah, blah. Don't care what they want to do, not allowed. IAS. 33 tells us how to do this. They can't do it like that. And if I remember rightly, I had a brief look through this earlier. 
yes, if you look at this, that's actually how they've done it. So they can't do that. That's really clear. So under IAS 33, earnings per share is incorrect. So number 10, EPS not done correctly. So if we leave that alone, they're going to disclose the wrong EPS figure. That's a big audit risk. That would mean we get our opinion wrong. Previous auditors resigned. Um, audit opinion was unmodified. You might highlight the resignation as being some sort of audit risk, given that we don't know why they resigned. It's not going to be a big issue, but just if you had highlighted that, I think that's probably something to look at. Um, okay, we'll come back to the figures. Oh, no, the figures are there. So the figures are the only thing we need to look at now. Now, one thing I want to mention here is, and the, the examiner keeps mentioning this, you must use the figures. First of all, for every item, you must think about materiality. So you must use these figures to think for each item that we're going to discuss, is it material? Because if it's not material, it's not really going to be an issue. We also need to look at these figures broadly and see, is there anything that would indicate there's perhaps a problem? So first of all, we've got revenue here. Revenue's gone from 67 to 98, which is a 46.3 increase. That is unusual. That looks like it could be overstated. So number 11, I'm simply going to say, is revenue overstated? We've no indication as to why it might be. I'm just saying that that looks very unusual. You could combine that revenue being overstated with the fact that this is a newly listed client or indeed the fact that they have the shareholders of the family, both of whom and both of those will rely on having more profit. And so if we've overstated our revenue, that should feed through to the profit and it does We've got a 48.1 increase in profit before tax. Now, having said that, the gross profit increase of 62.5 compared to the operating profit increase of 30.4 is unusual. I would think maybe there has been a misposting somewhere here that maybe some of our cost of sales have been posted in as expenses to try and increase the gross profit. So there also looks like there has been misposting of expenses. So do you see what I mean about using these figures? Do not ignore figures. That's it's one thing that the examiner constantly goes on about, that you must not ignore the figures that you're given in the question. They're crucially important. Um, finance charge, we've got an increase. Earnings per share, we've already discussed. We disagree with how they've actually calculated the earnings per share. So we will need some discussion of this point. Then we have the intangible assets, the development costs, 65.7 um, increase. We can combine that with our discussion of the investment. Remember we had this investment of 100 million over the few years. Again, that looks like it might have been capitalized. We just want to see then, was that done correctly? So has this been correctly capitalized? There's a risk that maybe they've been overcapitalized or um, expensed in previous years when they shouldn't have been. So we do need to look at that. The fact that there's a 65.7 increase in capitalization, again, would suggest that maybe there could be over capitalization of development expenditure. Okay, now that's how I would go through each and every a question one for P7 because it's absolutely 
so important that you identify all of the issues early. Because if you just start into your answer and start listing through these, what have we got? We've got 17 marks and we've identified 13 issues. Well, that's going to work out just about right. So we now know that actually by discussing each of these and getting, say, well, actually two marks per item, we'll check the marking scheme shortly, but it's usually going to be there, and a, there or thereabouts. So if we're going to do that, well then that's about enough. We don't need to go any further than that. So once we've got all of these items identified in our plan, we can now go ahead and actually build the answer. So we can do that in terms of looking at what the examiner actually wanted from this and see if these items in our plan correspond to the marking scheme and what the examiner actually put in their answer. The point here though is that, and I cannot stress this enough, you must make a plan. You must go through, you must identify the issues. Don't just highlight them because everything's important here. Highlight them, put a quick note on them and develop a plan to one side so that you know exactly what you were going to say about each thing that was important. We all know that there's important things in here, so don't just highlight them, actually use them to develop a, a plan, develop headings, put those headings into your answer booklet, and then get the discussion in below so that the examiner can see you've clearly identified the correct issue, and then you've gone on to fully answer it. And we'll go on to fully answer some of these and show you exactly how you would change those headings and develop them into an actual answer. Okay, now that we've planned the answer, we're going to discuss it in full, at least for some parts of it, to see how we would expand on it and fully explain it. In order to help you with that, you might look at this little explanation for the answer layout. This is the way I would lay out each and every part of my answer in P7. So I start with a heading to show that I've identified the issues. I then go on to explain the issue. For each issue, I make sure I mention why it's an issue and I relate it to the scenario. That's what the examiner is looking for here, the application to the scenario. Once I feel I've discussed one issue and fully explained it with reference to the scenario, I'll leave a line and make my second point, again explaining what the issue is, why it's an issue, and referencing it to the scenario. And fundamentally here, I understand there are three parts to each paragraph, and if I leave any of them out, I won't get the marks. The three parts being, what is the issue? Why is it an issue? And then relate that issue to the scenario. If you leave out any one part of that, you will not get the marks that you thought you will. And as I've mentioned, that's one of the main reasons that students fail the paper. They think they've identified the issues and they may well have done, but they haven't explained why it's an issue and related it strictly to the scenario. So that is fundamental. You must learn how to do that because that's how you pass P7. So let's look for this particular paper, how we might have done it for at least some of the areas that the examiner identifies as those that will give us the marks. Okay, so we're now looking at developing a full answer for June 15, question one, part B. We've already done an answer plan, so what I'm going to do is build around the marking scheme that the examiner gives us to see where we would have got our marks and to give you an idea, at least for some of it, of exactly what you could have written, the sort of length of the paragraph you should be looking at and how you need to fully expand on the points that we identified in our plan. So 
In the answer scheme we're told generally one and a half mark for each point discussed and one mark for each calculation of materiality. So we'll look at materiality in a bit more detail in a later session but at this point it's crucial that you see that there is a mark for the calculation of it. So the first point they say is management bias due to recent stock market listing pressure on results. And we discussed that in our plan. We definitely identified that as an audit risk. But how would you expand upon it? Well, you'd probably say something like this. There's an inherent risk in the fact that the stock market listing during the year has occurred, is what I should say there, which will mean that the management will want to show good results. The fact that profit before tax has increased by 48.1% would also indicate that there has been potential overstatement. Both of those we identified in our plan, and this is how we would bring it through in a paragraph. That should get you the one and a half marks. And although we didn't say it was material, it's obviously material having gone up by that much. The next point was that management bias due to the owner's shareholding uh, is an incentive to overstate profit. Again, we identified this in our plan and in order to put that onto your actual paper, you'd be saying something like, there's a related risk of overstatement due to Dougal Doyle and his family members retaining a 30% equity interest in TED company, which is an incentive for inflated profit so that a high level of dividend can be paid. Once again, we're stating what the issue is, we're referring to the scenario, and we're fully explaining why it is a problem. So remember, we've got to do that for each and every one. The next point is that management lack knowledge and experience of the reporting requirements for listed entities. So we did note that the regulations, etc., would need to be applied. So there's a risk here that management lack the knowledge of the reporting requirements specific to listed entities. For example, in relation to the calculation and disclosure of earnings per share, which is discussed later in these briefing notes. Weak corporate governance, potential for Dougal to dominate the board. Again, we identified this. There were a couple of problems with the corporate governance. Structures not strong, too few non-executive directors, and therefore Dougal is in a position to dominate the board and influence the preparation of the financial statements. This increases the risk of material misstatement due to management bias. And revenue recognition was another key area we mentioned. Should the deferred revenue be deferred, the license income, so that makes up 13.4% of total assets. Remember, use the numbers if you can, which makes it material. Extra mark for talking about that. And it may be that management control along with the risk and rewards have passed to the buyer and that the revenue should not be deferred at all, leading to a potentially large understatement of revenue and profit. So you can see here, firstly, what the examiner wanted you to talk about, but you can also see how it's important that we expand upon it. A one line answer here is not going to be enough. You have to fully explain the points that you've made. You have to explain what the issue is, why it's an issue, and then relate it to the scenario. And only in that way can you get all of the marks that you could have got. Some of the other issues, now I'm not going to look at each in so much detail because we talked about them in our plan. Revenue recognition, whether it's recognised over an appropriate period, the risk there being that if they're recognising the revenue too late, well then income over a certain number of years is going to be misstated because they should have been recognising it earlier and in earlier years. E-commerce, they've got a new system for recognising revenue could be recognising it too early or too late. Foreign exchange transactions, the risk of using incorrect exchange rates. So we have 
Transactions in foreign countries, which means that we need to bring the money home, obviously. There's a risk that the incorrect exchange rate has been used to do that. And that could lead to overstatement or understatement of expenses. Forward currency contracts. Remember, that's that new Treasury Department. They maybe don't know how to recognise or measure the derivatives correctly. Remember, derivatives will be at fair value through profit and loss. And they already, as we can see in the next one, through this portfolio of investments, have a risk that the fair value accounting has not been applied correctly. So those two are related to that Treasury Department. Again, we mentioned specifically here the new team dealing with complex issues of Treasury management. Earnings per share we identify has been incorrectly calculated. So it'll be profit after tax. We need to allow for share issues, etc. There's the risk also of the incomplete disclosure. Perhaps they need a diluted earnings per share calculation. Rapid growth, which leads to control risk because of the increased volume of transactions. Profit margins, we identified this, remember. Cost of sales looked like it might be incorrect because our growth, gross profit margin had increased. Maybe we'd misclassified expenses. We also talked about the development costs and the risk of overcapitalization because development, uh, our intangible assets had increased so much we thought maybe the, they had overcapitalized development costs. Year-end counts for inventory had already taken place, which means it'll be difficult to assess the inventory valuation, can't attend the inventory count. And opening balances, if not discussed in A, which we did do actually when we discussed part A of this question. So look, all of those again, we identified in the question. We just need to make sure that identifying them is the first step we then go on to fully explain why it's an issue. And we should understand now through our discussion why that is the case.